Initial reactions to the Resurrection episode number four, entitled Us Against the World, along with your comments and questions, live from the fans, coming up next. Welcome to Resurrection Revealed. This is Resurrection Revealed. It's the unofficial podcast and blog by fans and for fans like you with theories and talk about ABC's Resurrection. And this is episode nine. Can you believe it? Nine already? Recorded live March 30th, 2014. And with you tonight, podcasting since 2005, I'm Wayne Henderson. And I'm Troy Heinrichs, still wrapping my head as it's spinning around and around in circles after watching this episode as things are repeating, reliving, and I don't mean to use the red handed as a pun in any way, but did you notice already this evening that Rachel was indeed wearing a red dress? Yes, the theme is in full force. So if, if we see a returned not wearing red, that's when we're going to really jump to conclusions. Well, I thought right out of the gate, first thing was that I had to go back because obviously in episode two, we saw that, you know, uh, that Jacob was having the dream. So I had to go back and go, man, is he sleeping? Because when Caleb is out there working on the deck in the middle of the night, the first thing that popped into my head is that nobody sleeps if you're a resurrected or returned person. So I think we got that confirmation later in the episode that Jacob is not sleeping, even though he seems to drift off enough that he can enter into a dream state. I think that's a great observation, and it makes me really leery of everybody that's involved here. On the other hand, I think it would be kind of cool to not actually need to have sleep and have a sped up metabolism, but I would go broke eating all the time. Well, and the thing that you have to wonder about, too, is what types of foods are they eating? Because it looked like from when they went under Jacob's bed that it was more sweet related, sugar related. So is it a carb thing? Because I know that it looked like, I don't know if it was noodles or um uh, I don't think it was mac and cheese specifically. And I know that, you know, Lane said last week that Caleb ate everything out of the, uh, out of the, fr- <laughs> but it, I wonder if it's a carb thing. Is it a sugar imbalance of some kind? I don't know, but those wrappers were very noisy. They were all crammed under his bed. It was crazy. So I have to sit there and go and look, wow, the, the Rachel reveal this evening, totally unexpected did not see that coming at all when she said did everybody else kill themselves too and i was like whoa where did this just go yeah i guess it does not matter in what manner that the returned died whether it was murder or an accident or a drowning or a suicide they're all returning or at least some of them i mean if everybody returned there's not going to be enough room in arcadia missouri if everybody going back to the civil war starts returning yeah, and I think that's another great question that came up this evening because when they were having the conversation in the basement with Rachel and Tom, Rachel said, I woke up three days ago and then I came here. So has it only been three days for everybody? Because remember, Caleb said that he had you know, woken up and it took him three days to get from Portland to Arcadia. So has it only been three official calendar days for everyone or does it just take three days from waking up and getting to Arcadia, regardless of where you are. I'm not sure of that, because, especially since Jacob, it's been 32 years. Does he just think three days have passed? Well, I don't know, because we never got specific timing on Jacob in the pilot. Maybe it took you know a day to fly from China, but then technically you lose a day because you cross the international date line. So it's really the same day. Oh, and then getting from LA to Arcadia is you know, a two day trip or whatever. Um, but yeah, Caleb specifically said that, you know, I woke up, you know, I woke up three days ago or I've been traveling for three days. And then Rachel tonight said, you know, I, you know, it took me three days, you know, since I woke up to get here. So this three days kind of thing is very interesting because something else resurrection related did happen in three days also. Uh, that is very true on a kind of unrelated theme there. Now, one thing that we do want to keep an eye of, we do want to keep tabs on the three days because I think you're on to something with that. But I noticed uh, in the chat room this evening, uh, Neil from Bowie uh, mentioned that the water theme is still in place and she drove her car off the bridge into the water. And we haven't necessarily seen Rachel eat yet was brought up in the chat room as well. 
She could this be is, on the run and hitting a drive through in town, maybe. <laughs> it could, well, she disappeared from the church on her way to the tree. She wanted to pick up a picnic snack to share with her long-lost lover. Oh, my. That was great scenery, though. That big tree out in the middle of the meadow. Very pretty. And is that the tree we've been seeing in the opening credits as the credits roll? Does that have some significance, that spot, other than just Tom and Rachel getting engaged at that point? Hmm. Time will tell. I have a feeling we're going to see that scene again because it was so good. I mean, the actual scene, the tree, the meadow, and everything that's there. And then, of course, um, Caleb saying, you know, even more are coming. We're not done yet. What do you suppose that means? And wh how does he have inside information? Is he the only returned that seems to have this inside information that more people are coming? Well, and how many more people are coming and where are they coming from? Because we still don't have this question of, is it just Arcadians that are resurrecting? Is it all worldly people could resurrect, but they're all coming to Arcadia? I think those are the questions that'll be interesting when he says more are coming, more what? Doesn't Neil Diamond have a song about that? They're coming that to Arcadia today. Noah, no more singing on the podcast. Sorry. Um, this is... <laughs> This episode was fantastic, and I think it really upped the ante on the whole tense and mystery, the whole theme and the darkness and the colors. I was literally on the edge of the couch watching this whole thing because I I had to keep a close eye on Caleb as well as his daughter, Elaine. She is gullible with a capital G. I, I, you know, and that was a great scene because I was gullible because they – or like, yeah, when they're explaining the bank robbery from the past, and then they did that kind of black and white look and feel, mm -hmm. and they then went to the color, and they were like, yeah, and then there was a third guy inside, and then there was a third guy inside. I thought it was still the past. And then Elaine comes out, and I'm like, man, she looks really good for being 19 <laughs> and looking exactly like she was when she was 32. And then I was like, oh, wait, this is a second robbery. That's awesome. Now, I think that part we were meant to... Uh be uh gullible because i it only makes perfect sense we see the flashback we go to commercial we come back oh the flashback's continuing of the bank robbery no wait a minute yeah the third guy and uh well caleb is a cold-blooded killer there's no way around it and uh he's at least at the present time behind bars but on tv we know how that goes but the real question i had is that when they were questioning elaine you know and you, you mentioned her being gullible you know, Bellamy says, you know, has your father accessed your computer in the last few days? And she said, no. But then when he says, did your father call you on the phone? She doesn't say yes right away, but implying. And then she said, yes, he said that he loved me. So why would she lie about him using the computer and not lie about using the phone? Or did she just kind of let the whole, yeah, he was on my computer when he brought me a sandwich slip, slip her mind? I'm not sure. I think she's just trying to cover up. And besides being gullible, she's, I don't know what the deal is. She so wants her father to be back, even if he's a cold blooded murderer who has used her bank computer, I guess, two times to access information about the routes of the, uh, of the armored cars. I, I suppose she does not password protect that puppy. Just let anybody sit down. Oh, let's see. Routes for an armored car. Check. Not or good. She, or she has the password of password or <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Or her dog's name. You know, all those bad things. But one thing's for sure. We're, we're going to have um, our buddy Travis um, infiltrate his character of Ray and have Ray talk to his sister and set her up with some better security. Absolutely. Mule actually brought up another good point in the chat room is – I know that they were talking about, you know, why isn't the mortgage paid off? And she's like, I need to take a second because I had to, you know, fix the roof and everything. So the real question is, why did he need a bunch of money now? Is he actually going to use this money as a front to basically fund the rest of the return, the more that are coming, or is it specifically to help his family? Do you think they may need some sort of funding? Is there a corporation behind this? Kind of like Dharma and Widmore on Lost was behind so many of the things? That would be bizarre. Or maybe it's even Big Pharma at the end of the day. You know, we, well, we have a lot of stuff going on with, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm a big pharmaceutical company and I need to basically, you know, make drugs for people to buy, am I not also creating the sickness that's going to oh. need those drugs? True. Poss 
Um, one thing that I noticed tonight that I thought was really, really interesting, because I picked this up a couple times, and it, it really stood out when Henry was on the porch and he was drinking the coffee and how the coffee was swirling and swirling and had that circular motion to it. That was cool. Almost like it was a black hole, right? Like, can yes. you escape from the black hole of your sins, your black hole of desires, your black hole of fears? You know, I thought that there was a real kind of imagery there. And then they jumped to the doctor's office, and then Jacob was playing with that standard doctor's office, push the, you know, pieces around on the little tracks and stuff, but they focused on the circular part and those little pieces were going around in the circle and the spiral. Again, kind of that circular black hole kind of imagery. Is there something to this circular motion now that we've had the robbery happen in the past and happen almost exactly the same way in the future? That was a great observation, Troy. I did not catch that. I mean, I did notice the scene. I think it kind of hypnotized me the way it was spinning around. And I was looking, trying to figure out why are we watching a black hole on Resurrection? And then it's clouds in the coffee and all of that good stuff. I didn't catch the circular part later on. But now that you mention it, um, that reminds me of a few things in the Dark Tower series about Ka being a circle and a wheel. So I'm hoping that every bad thing that Caleb has done is not going to happen yet again a uh, decade later or whatever. Well, and if you go back to the Aaron Zellman interview we did on episode two of the podcast, you can get that at resurrectionrevealed.com slash Aaron or slash two. Either way, I'll get you there. He talked about past being a character and past is always, you know, des if you don't learn from your past, you're destined to repeat the same mistakes you know, we've heard about this, you know, especially as history and the Civil War and all that comes back into it from that interview as well. So I wonder if the past is going to repeat themselves if you don't do something different with this second chance. So like Rachel has the second chance, you know, which, you know, then there's a lot of questions around should she be allowed to have a second chance because right. she did commit suicide. And then you have Caleb talking about second chances, yet he's not redeeming himself. You know, Jacob's the only one so far that seems somewhat pure of heart, but we don't know what his true motives are. So, you know, a lot of questions around seconds again from like the two rivers last week, the two options and two choices. So I, I wonder where this is going to go when you think of metaphorically everything they're lining up as the rules of the show take place. Well, what's interesting about the rules is, can you believe we are already halfway done with this first season of Resurrection? I know we are over the hill, technically, as we come down for the down ramp. I, I think it's going to be just as exciting as a roller coaster ride would be coming down the hill for these next four. I, you know, They're prepping for something, but Caleb's in jail, so what's going to happen now? Well, one thing I, I am curious about, especially since we're honored to have uh, Travis Young in the chat room this evening, who plays Ray on Resurrection, did he also lie to Sheriff Langston that... His dad, Caleb, had already left because it looked like there was a, a confrontation in the house, you know, and he was actually going to confront his dad. And I'm thinking, yes. And next thing I know, he's, he's telling the, the police and officer Bellamy that he's already left. That's a really good point. You know, they had the confrontation. And I don't know, because with how close they were to the house, you would assume they would have seen, you know, a car, a motorcycle or something take off from the house. At least dust kicked up on the road or something. So, yeah, maybe Caleb was still in the house and Ray did lie saying he had left already to kind of get him off the trail so that then Caleb could have a head start. But I don't think that would have been in Caleb's motive. or I'm sorry, in Ray's motive, though, because, you know, Ray hasn't been so, you know, welcoming of Caleb up until this right. point. But he did start to bond over the motorcycle last week. Yeah, unless there's going to be another scene that we're going to see. You know, time may have passed here, and maybe there's a scene where perhaps Caleb spills his guts and tells some of the information to Ray, or just threatens to kill him and scares Ray to death in saying, you, you need to let me go or else, you know. That's a good point. What else you got this evening, Wayne, that kind of stood out for you? What stood out for me is just kind of the feelings of trying to put myself in some of the characters' uh, spots. Like, for example, when Pastor Tom does talk with his wife and tells about this past very deep love relationship that he had with Rachel way back in the day before he became a pastor. And just imagining how difficult it would be to have 
that conversation, but knowing that now that she's returned, uh, he has to tell her. So he spills his guts and that's got to be a very difficult conversation, don't you think? Absolutely. And I think that's a great question we can ask Mark Hildreth this week. We are tentatively slated to interview Mark on Wednesday. So on the Thursday full episode, we should have some insights from Pastor Tom himself. So cross your fingers that that comes through. But I think the one really big thing that stood out was how his you know wife called him out. It's like, we've shared everything together, even things that bothered us. So now why are you, why did you hide this one thing? And it almost shatters the marriage in one fell swoop when you talk about trust. Well, and as soon as she spit out that sentence, I think she even repeated the ending part because it struck her right then and there. Is it because how deep your love was with this Rachel and there wasn't anything he could really say about it, which just makes things even more complicated. And the one other thing that really struck me that I'm sure we're going to have to, you know, get our thoughts together for when we record our full episode Wednesday night for Thursday morning is I thought it was great. And I wonder if you agree that we finally got to see Officer Fred, Sheriff Fred, I guess, and Marty actually starting to respect each other and to work together instead of just after each other the whole time. But not without a few quips at the beginning, though, right? He's well, like, true. hey, you, you were a cop. You know what a medical examiner is supposed to be doing, right? So I love that they had a little back and forth and it was more lighthearted humor, I think, than it was actual, you know, I don't like you so much. But I really like the dig where he's like, oh, you guys are finishing each other's sentences now, especially after the whole you want to get dinner last week comment. So is there something brewing between the doc and Marty? Ah, get it? Doc and Marty. Ah, uh, ah, uh, a little back to the future tie in. I think uh, that pretty much would explain the entire thing. I do think there's some sort of uh, relationship brewing there. But at the same time, it, it's also good to see Fred and Marty actually working together because it is going to take some teamwork to uh, try to battle the onslaught of the returned that Caleb is hinting at that uh, it's just beginning. Well, and the real question then is, is what team is Marty going to be playing on if the government does finally come and step in? Because you know they have to be coming right around the corner. Yeah, if the government comes, I think it's, it's going to, you know, kind of to use Caleb's words for their own team, it's going to be them against the world. That is very true. Very, very true. What about the closing scene there with Caleb? You know, he takes the water. Again, you have the water as the theme so far in the show, putting out the fire. But then it's almost like, even though it's steam, right? He's kind of like rising out of the ashes, kind of like the phoenix, you know, getting reborn. Did you kind of get the sense of that imagery as he kind of stands up in front there to face whatever's coming at him? I admit to not catching on to that imagery to me. I was so focused on the fact that Caleb looked 100% certifiable psychotic. And I think he was in that room in the, in the plant there all by himself. And yet he audibly says out loud, it's us against the world. He says that again, just like he did at the beginning to Elaine. Well, and that was what a lot of people on Twitter tonight were actually saying was, is he talking to somebody who's also sitting there and escapes a different route? Or is he talking on a s another plane of existence in that dream state to all the other returned so that they're sharing some kind of common, I don't know, sonar dialect, you know, and they can all communicate in a way. Obviously, we saw that with Jacob saying, oh, we just passed Caleb at my dad's factory because I felt him. So something's going on there. And I think that it's more the latter. I think it's he's communicating with a bunch of other people on another plane somehow than someone physically in the room with him. And I'm going to go against both of those. My vote is that he's just crazy and he was just kind of talking to himself. I mean, it's something I would do. <laughs> and then Neil in the chat room again, he's bringing a bun bunch of good questions tonight. You know, are the return mortal? So could they die a second time? I'm hope I, because Caleb is such a bad and dangerous person, I'm hoping we're finding out pretty soon because I don't think putting him in a small town jail cell is going to keep him from harming people or even keep him in that jail cell for very long. But then that brings up the question of if we kill somebody, are we any better as humans? When you think about what it means to be alive in this humanity and bonding uh, theme, you know, if we execute Caleb for what he, I mean, he just robbed a bank, but he now this time 
he did actually murder the third person in the back of the van. So we'd have to look and see what the you know capital punishment laws are for the state of Missouri, I guess. Well, not to mention killing uh, Mr. Gethard with a hammer. This is true. So he, I mean, he's on quite a roll after just being back to life for a few days. Well, there is a ton more we could chat about this evening. And I have lots of thoughts with the Tom and Rachel thing because, again, I am a Jason Mott, the returned book reader. Um, I b- do believe that Amazon was able to get some more hard copies. I know they sold out from the initial push of the uh, paperback version. Sorry, they sold out of the paperback version on Tuesday when it came out. But I think Amazon's got them in stock again. So you can pick up the hardcover, the paperback, the Kindle, any option you want. You can just head over to resurrectionrevealed.com slash Amazon to pick up a copy of that book because the pastor, former girlfriend concept is in the book. But it's a little bit different, and I'm glad they went with the route they did in the show because Rachel is much younger in the book. Cool. Well, I'm going to read the book, but not until after the series ends, which unfortunately, or at least the season ends, and that's only about a a month away. So I believe Amazon even has the audiobook version. That would be my vote to go with. So I'm going to have to get that and make sure it's here for after season one. I should at least listen so I can have something to dig into. But uh It's going to be interesting to see how all of this comes together. And with four more episodes left in this first, and hopefully there will be more seasons, but four episodes to go for now, uh, you know, they're going to keep the answers coming pretty quick. I do believe so, but we're going to dig even deeper into this episode. And we hope that you guys will as well, because we will be back later this week with a more in-depth review of this episode. So make sure you tell all of your friends on Facebook, on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, wherever you get the word out. Heck, Reddit even. It is the front page of the internet. Share this episode out there. Share your theories with the fans. Let's get them all in to 904-469-7469. That number again, Wayne? I would say that that's probably 904-469-7469. And you can also go to resurrectionrevealed.com slash feedback. You can record your voice uh, using the SpeakPipe widget right there on the site. There's other options as well. Plus, if you didn't have a pen or pencil or magic marker handy to jot down the phone number, it'll be uh, posted there on the site as well. We want to hear your thoughts, your theories. We want to share your voice with the world. You'll get full credit for every theory you have. It'll be forever on the podcast so people can come back and find it there. Again, resurrectionrevealed.com slash feedback. Also, if you're fans like us and you want to help keep this podcast alive, head on over to resurrectionrevealed.com slash support. Donate a few bucks, help keep the episodes and the interviews coming. And of course, leave a great written five-star review on iTunes at resurrectionrevealed.com slash iTunes. And our full episode is going to be out later this week with a special actor interview. Fingers across, like you said. Until then, I am Wayne Henderson. And I'm Troy. Thanks for hanging with us live tonight on Resurrection Revealed. And Resurrection Revealed is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find out more about our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to help you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx.